it, it's hard to find anything positive out of this coronavirus, but here in Northeast Arkansas, here in Jonesboro, in uh, uh, April, March or April, I think it was April, had a uh, tornado that uh, jumped around and landed in one of the busiest areas of Jonesboro uh, shopping-wise. It hit a, a large restaurant, but nobody was in it because of COVID. It hit our mall, but nobody was in it because of COVID. Now, there were some people that were hurt. No one was killed. If it had hit um, Cheddar's or the mall during normal shopping hours and, and eating hours, we would have probably lost 400 people. So, you know, that that's, you know, and, and I'm sure there's been some, many stories that go the opposite, you know, away from that. But there are some blessings. One other blessing, um, how many million people are now aware and know how to use Zoom or go to meeting or some uh, form of uh, media that they can do online? And that if they are sick, if if they are afraid to go to church because of COVID or whatever, they can still go to church. They can still hear the messages. They can worship. Uh, maybe they can't hug or shake hands with other people, but they can worship God. So, I, you know, while, you know, I don't want to say COVID's been a good thing. Those are, those are two things that I know of, and I'm sure each one of you all can name one too or more um, that, that have been, you know, these have been blessings. So anyway, anybody want to add to that or tell me to shut up? I'm an idiot. No, I mean, it's all about how you look at the thing, right? I mean, if you, <laughs> context is decisive, uh, or as you say, context is king. Um, and I think that if we are kingdom minded individuals, um, I think we can see, we can be content. I think Paul says, right, he can be content in any situation um, because he's coming from a a, uh, an empowering context. So, yeah. Okay. Paul was certainly thankful in, in uh, situations where I wouldn't be. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I was just watching. There's there's a movie called In Faithfully Yours that is it's it's really cute and it's 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 a, I'm not going into the plot, but. There's a, a young lady in it who's never been in a church before, ever, in her whole life. She's 30-ish, I guess. She's never been in a church before, so she goes with her mother-in-law, and first crack out of the bat, she's raising her hand asking questions <laughs> during the sermon. It's just hilarious. And, and one of the things that the, the, the minister says, is, you know, he's quoting Scripture, and he says, James won, and she said, uh, what uh, What did James win? <laughs> anyway, you all may not appreciate that kind of humor, but I do. Um, okay, so uh, here's our webpage. And, and I, as I was saying a little earlier, you, if no matter if you get an email from me or not, because sometimes glitches do happen, you can go to this website right here, and scroll about halfway down the page and it says how to join our sabbath studies or something like that click on that it'll take you to our to that night's bible study and it's the same one every week it doesn't change okay well let's just jump right into uh first corinthians 4 marion says covid has been an inconvenience it's been a blessing also no trick-or-treaters yeah that's a that's a good point our neighborhood was empty that night uh, it was amazing. Um, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, Paul starts this chapter with a suggestion or a command, you know, let a man so account. Look at it this way. That's what Paul is saying. Look at it this way, as ministers and stewards of Christ. Now, this leads us into another word study, but it's the, it, it's part of the same one that we did last week. 
we're going to repeat uh, the word huperitis, huperitis, and that's the one that means under rowers. And you know, it never hurts to be uh, repetitive. Generally, when I see the word minister, I think, okay, the Greek here is going to be diakonos or diakoneo, or depending on whether it's a verb or, or you know, a, a, a noun or a verb or whatever. So we, we discussed this last week, but this, this word here is completely different. Uh, and it, it gives us the concept of what our jobs are or what our job is. And that is that, that Christ is guiding the boat, the ship, but it's our job to make it run, to push it forward. And so the concept of under rowers, like we've seen in the movies where the galley slaves were all under underneath rowing and rowing, and then somebody's up there steering the ship. Well, that's the context and the concept that Paul is talking about here. Now, there's another word in here, stewards, that um, we we might want to we might want to talk about. Um, a little bit, and I just jumped ahead of my notes. Let me uh, let me say this in Luke one two. Luke used the same word. The word ministers is that same word, huperitis, under rowers. And then in Matthew twenty six fifty eight, and this one's a little bit different. And that's this is why I keep saying, and you all understand this, context is king. Peter followed him, and this is when Christ had been arrested. Peter followed him afar off to the high priest's palace, and he went in and sat with the under rowers, servants, to see the end. They were under rowers for the high priest. So you, you look at the context. This context uh, is a ministry, is, is servants, people teaching, and, and so on, and, and believe me, we're all supposed to be ministers. That word means servant, uh, but in this case, it means under rowers. We should all be under rowers. Um, so, it, it, you know, right here, as I say, context is king. The servants were the, the Greek word meaning under rowers. Um, let me back up. Uh, the, the word stewards here is translated from the Greek word oikonomos. And sometimes it's translated steward, sometimes governor, sometimes chamberlain. It means manager or overseer. It's different overseer than what we talked about a few weeks ago. Uh, it's, it's important to note that a steward was also a servant but it was a servant who was given the responsibility to oversee other servants of a family. You've probably seen movies where there's a prison and some of the prisoners are responsible for other prisoners. And I've forgotten what they call them. There's a word for it. Trustee. Uh, trustee, I believe is the way they pronounce that. And that's, that's what a steward is. So Paul put that in the context of the people uh, that we call uh, stewards. They are fellow servants and called by God to oversee other servants. Now, Barnes Notes is one of the commentaries that I, I look to frequently. <clears throat> Here's what it says. The office of steward was to provide those things which were necessary for the use of a family. And so the office of a minister of the gospel and a steward of its ministries, which are the two things that Paul mentions in the scripture, is to dispense such instructions, guidance, counsel, etc., as may be requisite to build up the church of Christ, to make known those sublime truths which are contained in the gospel, but which had not been made known before the revelation of Jesus Christ, and which are therefore called mysteries, as it's implied in this verse. 
Uh, it says they're ministers or under rowers of Christ and stewards or overseers of the house of the mysteries of God. And the Barnes Notes goes on to say that the office of a minister is one that is subordinate to Christ. They are his servants. I apologize. I've had a lot of sinus drainage and I may cough a lot tonight. So every once in a while, you'll hear me skip a beat, and, and I'm trying to stave off a, a cough. Uh, second thing that Barnes Note says is that those in the office, that's the office of steward, should not attempt to be the head of the sect or the party in the church. And that also, same, def same comment works for these under rowers. Number three, that the office is honorable as that of a steward is. And number four, that Christians should endeavor to form and cherish just ideas of ministers to give them true honor and not to overrate their importance. Both of those things are very important and both of those things have been abused. Um, I know people who no longer respect anyone who they know of was ordained in in a, a previous church that we split off from. I know some people who literally think they are gods, little g, uh, that have, have put them up on a pedestal. And of course, one of the problems, as you all know, if you put some, if you put a human being up on a pedestal, guess what? they're going to fall off. And then where are you? If you've <coughs> put them up uh, high on a pedestal and then they do something and all of a sudden, you know, where do you go from there? Okay. Paul continues in verse two and says, moreover, see, okay. So he said, let a man so account of us at the ministers of Christ, stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And it's certainly required in underrollers, in ministers, that a man or woman be found faithful. Now, a steward is to be faithful. Now, that's the Greek word pistos, P-I-S-T-O-S. -S. And it means to believe, to be true, to be trustworthy, to be reliable. As we have discussed before, the word minister has, and, and this is just me speaking, but I, I believe that it's been somewhat hijacked and isn't used the way that it was used by Christ, by Paul, by, you know, Peter, Luke, all, all, all of them. We have elevated it or we have destroyed it, but, you know, either way, go either way with it. We all should be ministers, diakonos, servants. But we are not all stewards of God's people. So if you think about it, that's the context. A minister, uh, someone who's been ordained to lead, to speak, to teach, that doesn't mean other people can't speak and teach, but someone who has been ordained and has been called of God and it's been recognized in them that they have these abilities that God Hopefully, we can see that God has called them. Hopefully, we can see the gifts in this person, man or woman, whoever it is. So they are stewards of God's people, but not everybody is a steward. Some people don't know how to treat other people, don't know how to talk to them, talk down to them, think they're better than they are. You all know people like that. You know, I certainly do. I've run across them you know, many, many times. Uh, anyway, let me go on. So Paul continues here in verse two by making a statement that sounds a lot like, now this is me speaking. Look, I don't really care what some of you think of me. I'm being judged by someone much higher than you. Now that, like I say, that's me. That's my interpretation of some of his meaning. But I've been studying Paul long enough that I think I can, I can see a, a, a lot about, you know, some of the things that he says and 
maybe read into it. Um, in verse three, he said, and, and I'm sorry, I, I jumped the gun. This is where Paul says that. But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you. Yeah, I don't care. I don't answer to you. I want to teach you. I want to lead you. I want to be someone you can respect. But if you don't, I can live with that. With me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of a man's judgment. He said, hey, look, I don't even judge myself for I don't know anything by myself. Yet am I not hereby justified? But he that justifies me is the Lord. We, you know, Paul, of all the people in the Bible, we know he was called by Jesus Christ himself. I mean, it's there in black and white in, in Acts. I don't remember where, eight, eight, nine, 10, 16, somewhere around in there. <coughs> Paul says, doesn't matter what you all think of me. It matters to me what Christ thinks of me and what the Father thinks of me. Now, the uh, another commentary that I like is the Preacher's Outline and Study Bible. It says this about how the Corinthians are judging Paul and others. Here's what it says. One of the serious problems in the Corinthian church concerned former ministers. Some of the church members were esteeming one minister above the other ministers. You remember last week we talked about, well, I'm of, I'm of Apollos. Well, I'm of Paul. Whoa, I'm of Christ. You remember we went through that. And, and, and so the POSB says some of the church members were esteeming one minister above the other ministers. They were judging the gifts, ministry, and effectiveness of their former ministers, and the inevitable happened. You know, this, this is going to happen when you start doing that or when people start doing that. Some of the people had been helped and blessed by Apollos, so they spoke up for him. Others had been helped and blessed by Peter, so they spoke up for Peter. Still others had been helped and blessed by Paul, so they defended Paul. And they, they reached what we call a critical mass where there were, there were problems and issues, and we're going to see this as we go through this letter, in both letters, that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. It says the matter, the POSB goes on and says, the matter became critical for the people began to judge the minister's preaching style, their ability, their eloquence. Paul didn't have a lot of that, did he? Their charisma, Paul didn't have any of that. Their intelligence, he had a bunch of that. Their gifts, their call, and success. Success, counting numbers. You know, we, we all have a tendency and I just generalized, I, I apologize. <laughs> Many of us have the, uh, I think, mistaken idea that numbers is all that matters. And that's, that's not true at all. Quality, character is much more important than numbers. And it goes on and says, the whole scope of their ministry, little groups were buzzing about, talking up the merits of their favorite ministry. Deep feelings settled in, and the fellowship of the church was threatened. Now, this is the, the POSB was uh, uh, continuing with their, with their thought. Now, here's, here's my thought. I find it interesting, and, and, and let me start off here before I go any further and say there are things we don't know. There are lots of things I don't know. And this might be one of them. So just bear with me and just think about this. I find it interesting. This is me speaking. I find it interesting that the Aramaic or Greek word Cephas is not translated in this, which comes from chapter three. You know, if you remember last week, you called him Cephas. Didn't call him Peter, you called him Cephas. The Greek equivalent for Cephas is Petros. I think many of us know that. Both Cephas and Petros mean rock. In most places, the Greek is used, but in chapter three, the Arama Aramaic is used. They didn't translate Cephas into Petra or even Peter. 
Usually it's translated Peter, but for some reason in chapter 3, it isn't. So is that the same Peter that we know of as one of the apostles? I lean toward yes, but why did they not translate it? You know, it's just an interesting, an interesting question. Now, John did translate it in his gospel in, in uh, chapter 1, verse 42. He brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah, okay? His name was Simon, his name was Peter, his name was Cephas, his name was Petra, Petros. You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Now this, I'm not going to go into the whole thing, but here, right here, Christ said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And the rock he was talking about was Pet was uh, Petra not Petros. Petros means little stone or stone, and Petra means large rock. And he was talking about, Christ was talking about himself. He wasn't talking about Peter. But anyway, that's a whole other subject. Um, so um, as I said, the untranslated word Cephas begs the question, is this the Peter the apostle? Uh, you know, we don't know. Uh, one thing that we can find nowhere is any proof or even an indication that Peter the apostle was ever in Corinth. Now, that doesn't mean he wasn't, but we don't find anything saying that he was. And hence, this Cephas may or may not have been the apostle Peter, because we don't know if he made a trip to Corinth. Um, I couldn't find a single commentary that showed a visit to Corinth by Peter. And there's no scriptural evidence that he did. <clears throat> and I'm not saying that he didn't. But Paul includes this Cephas in his comment in chapter 322. So it's a possibility. It's also a possibility that he was talking about the Peter back in Jerusalem that these people were familiar with. You know, I'm, I'm of Apollos. I'm of Paul. I'm of Peter, speaking of, you know, maybe it was someone who had come from Jerusalem. So anyway, I, I'm, I know I've spent way too much time on that. Anybody got any comments? Okay. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 21. This is, I'm going back. Therefore, and, and this is, I, I'm, maybe I should have put this first, but we can, you know, we'll go back. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours and you are Christ's and Christ is God's. Now let's continue in verse five. Paul goes on and he says, this is uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter four, verse five. Therefore, <coughs> judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes. When is it that we're supposed to judge? After Jesus Christ returns, when we're spirit, spirit beings, when we have the mind of God, so to speak, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make clear, that's what manifest means, will make clear the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. And that's talking about physical human beings. Obviously, those of us who have been changed at Christ's return are going to have praise of God. That's obvious. But men during the millennium, after Jesus Christ returns, his feet land on the feet of olives, the the river of life goes forth uh, from Jerusalem and cleanses the miry places. And, and it's also, I, I, I believe, metaphorical of a spiritual river of God's Holy Spirit going forth from Jerusalem, cleansing the minds of men. And this is going to go on for a thousand years, as we understand it. And at the end, Excuse me, at the end of the thousand, Mike James, 
I think it's an important point. We can't really judge people. I'm sorry, Michael, I'll have to pull that back up again. It's an important point. We can't really judge people now because we don't know what motivates them to act as they do exactly. But God does, and we and we will also when we're born into his family. Exactly. Thank you, Mike. All right, let's see. I, I have my my go to meeting menu goes up to the top of my page and it it, it cuts out some of the some of the scripture. Uh, so sorry about that. So he says, he, you know, don't glory in men, whether Paul or Apollos or whatever, all are yours in your Christ and Christ is God's. Now, where did I get to? Okay. When does Paul say we're to judge? It's like what Mike just said. We're going to be judging after we are changed after we are immortal, after we have the mind of God, after the return of Jesus Christ, and then he's going to do the judging, but we can judge also, but, but it, it's not our judgment that makes any difference. Okay, verse, oops, verse six of First Corinthians four. And these things, brothers, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes. Why? That you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written. And he's talking about himself and he's talking about Apollos so that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. This is a real problem with human beings. I mean, it really, I mean, goodness gracious. I don't even want to talk about the election, but look what has Wow, I, not going there. This this comment that Paul makes here goes back to where Paul criticizes them about having put him or Apollos or, or Cephas on a pedestal. <coughs> and when another leader comes in, he's looked down on because he isn't Paul or Apollos or Cephas. And and these people are filled with self-importance or or the, the, the people that are, are put up on a pedestal. They're puffed up because they're, well, they're, he's, well, he's important. He's, wow, he's a minister or he's, uh, you know, whatever. I, verse seven, I'll go on. For who makes you different from one another? And what do you have that you didn't get given to you? That's what Paul's saying. We don't need to be glorifying ourselves or thinking that we're smarter or better because everything we have has been given to us by God. Now, if you did, and I'm talking about knowledge and, and the ability to speak and so on. Now, if you did receive it, why do you glory? As if you didn't receive it, you picked it up all by yourself. Now, you're full. Now, you're rich. He's, and he's being sarcastic here. You have reigned as kings without us. And I wish God, I wish to God that you did reign, that we might also reign with you. And then he goes on, he says, they're name droppers. I'm not sure what version that is. I've forgotten, but I I love <coughs> I love that. You know when you you know hey look, um, Apollos is a friend of mine. Yeah, we went to school together, and uh, you know I, I'm real I'm his best friend really when you get when you get right down to it. And his wife uh, ran around with my sister, you know, and and so if if you if you need anything from Apollos, you just you just let me know. That's a name dropper. And Paul says these people are name droppers. And he's being very sarcastic. And I, it's one of the reasons I love Paul, because I love sarcasm. He says, okay, you people have all this knowledge and you're puffed up because of it. Where'd you get it? Where'd it come from? Was it not given to you by God? And he's going to continue this thought when he discusses their spiritual gifts in another chapter down the road. Now, here's what Expositor's commentary says. 
Some Christians evidently were boasting because of their talents, positions, parties, and who they knew. So Paul puts the rhetorical question to them, what do you have that somebody didn't give you? What do you have that God didn't give you? The obvious answer is they received everything from God and had no right to boast. He therefore derides their conceit by a series of dramatic boasts of theirs, here in verse 8. Uh, they, so they think, have all they need. They're rich. They're reigning like kings, even without any help from Paul. The Corinthians evidently thought they had reached full maturity, <clears throat> and he talks to them about that later on, doesn't he? They thought they had reached full maturity and were ruling and reigning rather than walking humbly with God. Now, back to the uh, preacher's outline, and, and, and I think it's, it's POSB, Preacher's Outline and Study Bible. Who makes you to differ from another? What makes you think you have superior judgment to others? Now, this is, POSB is, is, is putting this question to these people in Corinth. What makes you think you've received enough spiritual growth and insight that you can judge God's ministers, God's servants? What gives you the right to feel you have received more than others because you sat under some minister? You know, I'm, I'm of Apollos, I'm, I'm of Paul, I'm, I'm of whatever. What makes you think you are more spiritual than other believers? Boy, I've, I've run into a lot of people. And, and here's, here's something I don't understand. I've heard this. People have said this a hundred times uh, to me. Well, I'm not really religious, but I'm spiritual. Now, I, I, I'm sorry, I hadn't figured that one out. Does anybody have a, a clue as to what that means? Because I don't, but I've heard it numerous times i think uh some of the so one way i've heard that expressed is that uh you're not part of formal religion but you have spiritual ideals and uh thinking okay i, I don't i guess Does i don't that help? yeah and I, I don't have to believe in god or believe in uh Christ. Yeah, some some people would take it as far as not having to believe in God, but still be spiritual, uh, understanding love and how to treat others. But uh, then there'd be others who may believe in God, but uh, are not part of any formal religion, but uh, they would consider themselves to have spiritual ideals similar to religion. Okay, okay, I got you. Because so you can go either way. You can either be a, a believer or not a believer, but consider yourself to be spiritual then. Okay. Uh, the POSB goes on and, and kind of asks the same questions Paul asked is, what do you have that you didn't receive? Uh, what is your spiritual gift? Did you create it or was it the gift uh, given to you by God? If you're spiritually mature, did you earn the maturity? Oh, that's a word that should never be in any of our vocabularies, folks. Earn. Just throw it out. Come up with a different word because <laughs> we haven't earned anything. We can't earn anything. So anyway, just let's not even use that word. Um, or did God, by his grace, grow you? Which is a an interesting analogy as a a plant? Did God grow you? And then the third thing that the POSB says is, now, <clears throat> if you received it all, all the blessings of life and of Christ and of the church, why are you boasting of being super spiritual? Because that's what these people were, some of these people were doing. Why are you acting superior to other believers? And you all, all everybody on here has run into people like that, that think they are so superior. Um, in verses 9 and 10, Paul tells them that the apostles are not reigning over them. I'll read it here in just a second. And his sarcasm continues when he tells them they're strong and honorable, but he and his fellow disciples are weak and despised. I just love this. For I, I, I think 
that God has sent forth us, the apostles, last, as if it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle to the world and to angels or to messengers, by the way. Don't forget, the word angels was never translated. It's a transliteration. It's the Greek word angelos, um, and, it, and it means messenger, and to angels or messengers and to men. And then he goes on, he says, we are fools for Christ's sake, but you're wise in Christ. We are weak but you are strong. You are honorable, but we are despised. That's love, Paul's sarcasm. Verse nine. Oh, I did nine, didn't I? I, I got, I got my, my comment before my scripture. Um, in verses 11 through 13, Paul describes the hardships that he and his fellow leaders have suffered throughout their ministries, hunger, thirst, lack of clothing, hung, hun, hungryness, homelessness, I mean. Even to this present hour, right up to today, we hunger, we thirst, we're naked, we're buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place. And we labor, working with our own hands. You remember, Paul didn't take money from any congregation that we know of, except for Philippi. He worked, he built tents, made tents. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We're made as the filth of the world and are the off-scouring of all things to this day. And that, that's what Paul thought of he and his fellow ministers. They were to work, they were to earn you. Boy, I almost said it, didn't I? They were to, uh, oh, I could say it when I'm talking about working for a living. They were to earn their own money. Now, in verses 14 through 16, Paul backs off a little. He, You know, I don't know. You, you never know. He may have thought, oh, you know what? I need to back off of this just a little bit. And he tells them that his harsh words are not to shame them. <coughs> but to warn them to get rid of their arrogant attitudes. He hopes to bring about a change of heart in them. That's, that's what Paul's trying to do. He calls them beloved sons, and he's been trying to teach them like a father would a son. He says, you know, look, I'm not writing these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you, don't we do things, or when our kids were young, didn't we sometimes have to get on them, to teach them, to build character. Of course we did. And that's what Paul's saying that he's doing with these Corinthians. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers? For in Christ, I'm sorry, for in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Why I beseech you, be followers of me. And Paul says, be followers of me as I follow Christ. He said that in other places. <coughs> Verse 17, for this cause have I sent you to Timothy, who's my beloved son and faithful in the Lord. Now, Timothy was not his blood. He was not adopted uh, even legally. He was his son in the faith. And he says, he's gonna bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ. Timothy's staying there, and he's going to teach you what I've been trying to teach you, what I've been teaching you. He's going to reiterate the whole thing. As I teach everywhere, same stuff in every church. So Paul is sending Timothy back to work with them. But he knows that some of them aren't going to listen. Probably some of the leaders who are causing these problems. He says, now, some are puffed up as though I wouldn't come to you, but I will come to you shortly if the Lord will. You know, he, he had spent, I think, a year and a half in Corinth. And when he's writing this letter, I believe he's in Ephesus. Uh, he says, but, but I'll come to you shortly if the Lord will. Well, based on we understand, the Lord did not will, that Paul never went back to Corinth, based on the scriptures now. 
uh, everything that happened is not in the scriptures, uh, just the important stuff, as uh, a, a friend of mine said one time. But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will, and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. We have the Holy Spirit in us. And that is a little teeny bit of the kingdom of God. And one of these days when Jesus Christ returns, and I, I, you know, this is just kind of the way I look at it, that little teeny bit of the, of, of the Holy Spirit's gonna expand until we are whelmed, which I love that word. That's, that's the definition of baptize, to be whelmed, to be totally covered. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What will you? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love and in the spirit of weakness? Now, chapter five continues Paul's chastisement, but that's gonna have to wait till next time. This is this is a little bit shorter uh, tonight. Has anybody got any, any comments? Like to add anything? Please do, jump in. Yeah, I uh, I like uh, Paul at the end there. Um, in my NIV, it says uh, verse, let me see where it is here. Uh, verse, the last verse, 21. What do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a whip or in love and with a gentle spirit? So <laughs> he's kind of telling them, hey, there's a time for me to uh, ream you out if you want it. I don't want to do that, but uh, I, I can. And uh, sometimes that, that's the way to go. Like uh, Jesus with the money changers, uh, these apostles and uh, teachers are not always uh, mamby-pamby and uh, bringing love all the time. Love can sometimes come with a, uh, with a whip. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you said that. What was it? How did it start again? What do you want me to do? What was it? Yeah, let me read. Hold on. I just closed it. Oh, sorry. Let me get back. Uh, it's the last verse. I'm reading out of the NIV. So, again, that's a, another <laughs> take on the wording here. But uh, it says there in verse 21, instead of uh, shall I come to you with the rod, it says, what do you prefer? Shall I come to you with the whip? or in love and with a gentle spirit. You know, same thing as your verse 21, just slightly different. Uh, yeah, Rod, what, what do you Rod might hurt a little more. <laughs> what do you prefer is the part I like. What do you prefer? Yeah. I'm, I'm writing that down, even though I have NIVs prefer. I typically, uh, in, in our Bible studies, uh, use the King James, the NASB, the NIV and, uh, you know, I mean, I don't put all of those translations in, but, uh, and, and then in, in word search, the software that I use, <coughs> it has a parallel Bible. And I think I have like 13 translations in the parallel Bible. And I can look at a verse, uh, all at the same time in 13 different, uh, translations, which is really neat. Uh, to be able to see. Most of the time, they're pretty close. Every once in a while, uh, you know, somebody gets out there somewhere, but um, okay, thanks, Mike. Anybody else? Yeah, Skip. Uh, one of the things you pointed out in the beginning was that these men were true servants and that their whole lives were serving and taking care of people and pointing things out to them and yet you, you know you read in one of these verses here which verse was it uh, uh verse 11 you know they had they had nothing basically no dwelling place and they basically lived from day to day at the um, mercy of the people and you know having them help take care of them they, they just you know didn't have anything specific in their lives that's a, that's a good point and by the way i sometimes 
I won't call it hyperbole, but I, I overemphasize stuff sometimes. And I don't want anybody to get the impression that I don't respect the, the ministry. There are there are many, many men uh, that I've met in my lives that have been ordained that I highly respect um, as, as servants. And there have been a handful of them that uh, should never have been ordained. And I, I'm sure you all maybe have run into that. But I have a high regard for the ministry. Uh, but at the same time, I want to look at the Greek and, and see what the, you know, the translation is. You know, one of the, one of the best examples of how important a translation is, in my opinion, is when you read about hellfire. And when you read about hellfire, it, it, the word hell most likely is translated from the word Gehenna, G-E-H-E-N-N-A, at least that's in uh, right, Mary, and we respect them, but don't, we don't idolize them. Uh, but the, the word Gehenna means Valley of Hinnom. It was a valley outside of Jerusalem that they burned the trash. And, and it, it burned all the time. It was a, quote, everlasting fire, if you will. And <coughs> sometimes they threw the bodies of men who had been crucified in there. And, and so uh, one of the things I think is important in Bible study is how did the people who heard Jesus Christ speak, what did they think he meant? Because they knew the language. We, we're, we're three languages. Three, we're three translations from, uh, two or three translations from, from what, uh, from from what they heard. So when when a, a someone living in in Israel or someone reading the scriptures that understood Greek or Aramaic, when when they heard Christ say hellfire, they thought trash dump. And what happens? to something that is thrown into a raging fire. What happens to it? Does it last forever? No, it burns up. And that's what many of us believe is gonna happen to the wicked who choose not to obey Christ. Boy, did I just get off into another subject. But just, just remember, it is important to think of what the people that Christ or Paul or Peter or whoever was talking to when we read the scriptures. And so the Greek is important. Uh, now, granted, I'm not a Greek scholar, not a Hebrew scholar. You all, you know, anybody that's been up around me for very long knows I'm not a scholar, but I can read a dictionary and I can apply a, 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 the Greek meaning of a word so, you know, there are a lot of words. Baptism is one. Baptism, baptize is another word that was transliterated. It was not translated. <coughs> it, it, it comes from the Greek word baptizo. And that baptizo means to be whelmed, as I mentioned earlier. It means to be totally covered. You know, uh, how many times have you heard somebody, well, I was just overwhelmed by such and such. They were just totally covered up. It was, you know, and to be whelmed, speaking of baptism, means to be totally put underwater. Now, I know everybody doesn't agree with that, and that's okay. That's okay. Uh, but there, there are a lot of uh, words that were, were transliterated. Angel, as I said earlier, is one of them in the Old Testament in the in the Hebrew language, that word is mal Moloch, and it, it means the same thing. It means messenger, and that's where it's most important, in my opinion, to understand that the word Moloch means messenger, because a lot of times when you read "angel of the Lord," <coughs> it should say "messenger of the Lord." And it's talking about the being who became Jesus Christ. I don't know any other way to put that. You know, it was Jesus Christ. I'll just put it that way. So anyway, sorry. That, I, I just got, uh, I got sidetracked there a little bit, didn't I? Well, you hit it in the very beginning when you started talking, Skip. You said context is king. 
and and that's really what what you have to understand with Paul's writings is and it takes sometimes several verses or a couple chapters to to realize who he's talking to and what he's trying to get across to them and 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 that's where it brings out what is actually going on in in the scripture elements that he's discussing at the time so yeah you mentioned that at the very beginning of the study yeah context is so important i have a uh, you yeah. all know i'm sorry go ahead oh i was just um i was going to say you know to echo uh, what john was talking about it's, it's the <laughs> context what is your context when you come to scripture are you coming to the scripture with the context that i know you know, I'm learned, I know, like, like Paul was talking about these, these people, right? Like he's rebuking them. Do you come with the big heads? But I know everything, and I know all the, the, the translations. I know all the nuance, and I know all the the, um, the little idiosyncrasies, the, the idioms that are being used here. Or do you come humbly to the, to the scripture, going, you know, it appears to be this way. I mean, to, to really err on the side of caution and to err on the side of being conservative, um, I think how you read your Bible, you know, um, really, <laughs> it shapes how it occurs, um, if that makes sense or not, but um, we're talking about the importance of context here, and I think that how one goes about reading their Bible or how one goes about serving, for that matter, um, really shapes the whole thing, so, um, yeah, absolutely, you're, you're hitting it, Skip, already. You know, uh, one of the, one, one of the, uh, most, I don't know. Uh, okay, let me let me just say what happened. I, you all know that I go to a Bible study on Wednesday mornings, and uh, uh, most of the guys there, everybody but me, I guess, is is a Baptist. And I want to tell you something. Those guys know a lot more than you think they know. Now, uh, I, I was shocked at to hear some of the things that they believe. But anyway, we were about to study the Book of Revelation, and uh, uh, the the leader's name's Doug. Uh, yeah, Henry says the earth was whelmed with water. Yeah, good point. Good point. I didn't see the second part, Henry. I'm sorry, Hank. Uh, anyway, um, so so Doug read the first uh, verse, you know, uh, and where John said, "I was uh, in vision on the Lord's day," and and he said. You know, so uh, John was in vision on a Sunday morning. And I said, um, I, now I, I'm very careful about when I, uh, what fights I pick. And I mean that nicely, I, you know, we don't fight. I said, Doug, hang on a second. Where do, you, where, where do you get that this was on a Sunday morning? And he said, well, it's the Lord's Day. And the Lord's Day is Sunday morning. I said, okay, well, I'm, not going to get into that, but where do you get that John is talking about Sunday morning? Well, because he said it's the Lord's Day. And I said, well, let me ask you this. What is the context of the entire book of Revelation? What's it about? And he said, well, it's about, you know, uh, the tribulation and Christ's return and so I said, well, don't you think that's the day of the Lord that it's talking about? Not a Sunday morning? And he went, well, I never thought about that before. <laughs> and, and I said, well, that's, what, that's the way I look at it. And, you know, we just have a difference of opinion. And he said, well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure they're so different anymore. But he had never looked at it that way. And... <clears throat> That's, that's what I'm saying. We need to understand how the people in those days believed what they were told, what they heard, the understanding that they have, and so on. Well, okay, well, anyway, I'll shut up. I'm, I'm going off in, a, in another direction again. Any other thoughts or comments? Okay, next week, First Corinthians. Hold on, wait, 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 wait. I was trying to hit the mute button. You know, you're just proving the point that, uh, that I still am of the mind that you need to teach a course on how to evangelize to uh, to Baptists or maybe just the Protestants. That uh, you're you're the perfect preacher for it. So I'm still of the mind that you uh, 
we have a, or, or maybe we can work on something together to, to have a course where we, we help uh, our brothers and sisters in the Church of God tradition to, to let's say, uh, meekly offer intelligent questions. You asked him some great questions there that, that got him to think, and I think he probably, um, well, that's just, that's, a, that's an invaluable gift, man. So, anyways, for what it's worth. Well, uh, you keep proving that you need to do that. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, as, as many of you know, I spent 30 years being the, the guy that jumped in somebody's face and told them they were stupid idiots because they didn't believe the same way I did. Can't you read what? It's right there. You know, and and uh, it, it, it actually took my wife <laughs> who said, you know, you keep this stuff up, Skip. You keep throwing Christmas trees out the door and keep treating me like a dog. I'm not going to be around much longer. And I, and I, you know, I, I went back and I thought, you know, and prayed and I went, you know, I don't think God wants me to get a divorce. I think I'm better off if, if, uh, if I quit acting that way. So it took me another 10 or 15 years to quit acting that way. But finally, you know, I've, I've gotten to the point where uh, I can uh, have a civil conversation with someone who, who doesn't believe exactly what we believe as long as they believe in Jesus Christ and worship the Father. If we've got that in common, I can talk to anybody. I can, you know, God has given me, you know, uh, he's finally shown me what an idiot I was. And, you know, hopefully I'm doing better. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Okay, well, next week, uh, 1 Corinthians 5. Um, I, and I'm curious, by the way, what, are, are are you all going to be getting with a bunch of people for Thanksgiving, or are you going to do it just the two? We're, we don't know what to do at this point. We have two sons in college. One's in Oklahoma. One's in uh, Conway, Arkansas. And uh, we, both our daughters live here in Jonesboro. And uh, we have our other, the other side of the family. Uh, uh, we have uh, our, our daughter, her husband, and their three boys who live here in Jonesboro. Uh, and, and we don't know whether to have a big family Thanksgiving. I mean, it's not big. There's 11 of us. Have a big Thanksgiving or not. What do you all think? Well, I, you know, I, I didn't want everybody to start at once. I Are you talking because of COVID? Yeah. <laughs> yep, because of COVID. Uh, but do you get together. your kids other times? Uh, the, the ones here in Jonesboro, yes. The the other two are gone. One's in Oklahoma and one's... Uh, uh, I, I mean, I'm willing to... Marion's having their usual get-together. I'm I'm... I'm leaning toward, yes, have all of us, but if anybody has a fever, uh, anybody uh, besides me have a cough, I know I have a cough, it's not COVID. Uh, you, you know, if, if they're not sick, then it should be. Uh, Thanksgiving, just being with some friends, probably wearing a mask. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't remember who that, I, could, I didn't see who that was. I'll, let me get this up here. Immediate family, yes, extended family, no. Yeah, that's Hank. Yeah, okay. Save me when I'm eating. Yeah, except when he's eating. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Uh, I guess that's it for me. So uh, next next Monday night, First Corinthians five. And by the way, I will. Uh, I'm going to start starting this meeting. I don't know, maybe around five o'clock four or five o'clock and you can join anytime you want to, but there'll just be silence until, you know, somewhere around a quarter till seven, but you can get on, go to meeting. will will keep you on. So you can get on anytime you want to, if you uh, go to our website and, and click on that link. So, well, all right. Well, listen, thanks folks. Good to talk to you. Have a good week. Stay safe. Don't get,